way live. <laughs> Good morning. We are four minutes late. Am I on live video? I need to take a picture of Kevin back there who has made this happen with long cords and extensions and um, magic. And when he told me, we're trying, we're trying, I told him that's all a steer can do. And when he said, it's coming, it's coming, I said, so's Christmas. Because those are the old things I remember from my dad. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Can you see me? I can see you. My name is Mike Evans. We're live at Tree of Life Nursery on Saturday, May 16th with a partial close down on society because of COVID-19. So we have a virtual workshop again like we've had in the past few weeks. And we thank you so much for being part of this with us today. We're gonna cover a lot of material. We've done some inspirational and some informational things regarding where the nursery is and how you can connect to the outdoors and thereby connect more to yourself and to others. And we love that philosophical stuff. But at the end of the day, horticulture is a skill, science, art, craft, a little bit of luck, alchemy. That's when you try to take common metals and turn them into gold. We're still working on that. And um, there's a spiritual aspect, but we're going to talk about horticulture, all right? And we're gonna talk about the month of May because we're smack dab in the middle of May and how May is a month that precedes the hot summer. We still get some relief in June, most of us close to the coast with June gloom, but get ready, little darling. It's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Here comes the sun, it's all right. So, to quote the Beatles. So, it is all right if you are not caught in August and September with your plants down. Good farming requires planning ahead and trying not to ever be playing catch up. I say trying because nature can throw you a curve and it'll go right in and you'll be standing there without a swing and it'll be a called strike. But that's, we try to get on base. And we try to do that by anticipating what's coming next. And that's the best of horticulture and the best of farming is to not be reacting to current situations, but acting proactively on what you know will be coming based on experience, forecasts, etc. And I've said many times, we live in Southern California. Our weather is not a surprise. This is not Idaho. It's not gonna be hot to this morning and hailing this evening. We can know within a, almost a 10 day range what's gonna happen with the weather. So we watch the weather forecast and we plan accordingly. We're gonna talk about five things. Let me see if I can remember them. Watering, pruning, mulching, feeding, and plant protection. We'll go quickly over these, and then we'll cover some of the questions which you've sent in and are sending in right now over the uh, uh, stratosphere. And we'll try to answer many of those questions during the content of the talk itself. So on watering, this is the month, May, when typically the native plant garden requires its first irrigation of the season. That means that in a normal rain time, like we've had great rains last winter, 20 inches or so here. Move the mic down. Move the mic down. Yes, sir. Excuse me while I move the mic down. Good thing we're all wearing the preparation for face masks. I've got places here. I need Dakota, the nursery dog over here with me for moral support. He's over there with Kevin. Is that better? <laughs> Text in or let us know how the audio is doing. If it's not any good, we need to know. May is that month when you first have to water because in a given year with good rains, we have soil moisture, which is available to the plants at a deep level. Let's talk quickly about soil. 
good soil supports healthy plants. And good soil, aside from the fertility aspects, the physical aspects are as such that they allow moisture and air to be in the soil at the same time. When I say air, particularly the roots need oxygen. So when we water or when it rains in the rain shower style, a little rain and then stops and a little more rain and then stops and then next day a little more rain, and we know those to be ideal, beautiful rain events, what's happening is the water's going into the soil and soaking down and then air is following it in and water and air and then in the soil root zone, we have both. And that's the best way to do it. I also know this about soil, aside from fertility and structural uh, qualities, we have temperature. Warm temperatures favor tropical plants, annual crops, growers. But since most of the native plants are cool season growers, they need to have their roots in soil, which does not get particularly warm. And that's found at a depth of about 14 to 18 inches. This is true of most plants. That's the sort of ideal root zone. Because at that level, we have consistent temperatures, consistent moisture, consistent air availability, much deeper, and there are some roots down there for big trees and whatnot, but they tend to be the anchor roots that are kind of holding everything together. But the feeding, the actual useful roots that are picking up oxygen and water and nutrients are in the profile about six inches to 14 in depth. So that's the zone of the soil that we're going to manage the water for. And after a good rain year, it's already moist. So your job between now and November is to maintain a consistent level of moisture at that level. When I say consistent, I mean fairly consistent. It's not a flat line. It gets a little dry and then it gets saturated by your irrigation event. Then it gets a little dry and then it gets saturated again. But the lines are very gentle. There's no absolutely sogging wet for a long time or absolutely dry for a long time. So you do this by soaking the ground We're trying our best, not we, Kevin's amazing, he's doing, we good? Should be good. Put a nickel in it, <laughs> another thing my dad used to say. Okay, <laughs> it probably cost a quarter an hour, maybe a credit card. Where was I? You gotta move the mic low. Low. Can do. Yeah, I know. Is that good? How's that? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, and sorry again for the interruption. Thank you, Kevin. So when we water in May, we're actually getting the soil ready for July. That doesn't mean you're going to not water again until July, but now you're getting the hang of it to keep that precious moisture down where it can do some good. And the way to do that is to apply water in an event called an irrigation event or a deep soak. And this is done by applying the equivalent of about one inch or one and a half or two inches, depending on your conditions and your soil and your plants and many factors, to the ground in one given event, which may require that you leave the sprinklers on for a long time. That would be unacceptable for many reasons. It would puddle. It might run off. It might be on during the middle of the day when it's hot. We don't want to do that. So the best way to get that deep watering with one and a half inches of 
the precipitation to soak into the ground with air following it is to make an irrigation event a two or three day affair where you water in the morning early on a given day, let's say for half an hour, and it soaks in. The next day you do it again for a half an hour and it soaks in even deeper because the new water slides through the already wet zone pretty easily and goes deeper. And then you do it again on the third day and it goes even deeper and each time air has followed the water into the soil and now you've done a deep soak. That, is a, a, that kind of watering is applied every two to three weeks, maybe once a month during the dry season on native plant gardens, e equaling about 10 inches of water in a year applied May through October. That is a incredible water savings compared to obviously turf, which is about 60 inches of water a year, or ornamental plant gardens, which are around 40, or even the so-called, I'm gonna use a term here, California friendly gardens, which get by on 20 to 25 inches of water a year, native plant gardens, 10 inches or thereabouts of supplemental water on top of rain applied during the warm season. That's a deep soak. If you really wanna make your plants happy, which will make you happy, you start now in May and you carry this uh, practice right through the summer of going out in your garden in the late afternoon, early evening when the sun is still in the sky, but quite low. It may still be warm, but it's soon gonna be cooler and there's no direct hard sunlight on the plants. You walk out into your garden and you get a spray nozzle on the end of your hose and you water down the plants, the, the leaves and the surface of the soil. And in no way are you allowing any water to soak into the ground. This is not an irrigation. Roots do not even see this water. This is called a refreshing sprinkle and it cools the leaves, it cools the soil surface, it keeps the leaves clean, it allows you to kind of appreciate your garden at that time of day. Hummingbirds come in and take a quick bath. You turn the hose straight up and let the water come down on you. Yes, you're fully clothed and it feels great and you will be one with your garden more than ever before. And these refreshing sprinkles, as we call them, can be done two, three times a week. You could do it every day, but it's a little excessive, but knock yourself out. You can't hurt anything. The plants love it because they cool off before nightfall and they dry. The leaves dry before nightfall, thereby preventing any fungal diseases or any weird problems that can happen at dark. And when they wake up, sorry, real scientists and botanists out there, when the plants wake up in the morning and they see that sun coming up in the east and it's gonna be 100 again, they say, no problem. I've got water in my root zone from the deep soak and I've got fresh, clean leaves with a whole night of being cool to take on this next day. And you'll have a healthy garden by combining deep soaks with refreshing sprinkles and starting now in May. We've got a question from Mickey who shared regional parks and he was okay with a hose and no irrigation. Thank you, Mission Trails Regional Park for the question, is it okay with a hose and no irrigation? In many ways, it's better. Thanks for the question. Any way you can get water to your plants that allows you to be there, I believe is better than a controller and a, and a sprinkler system. That's, but you, if you have control of your controller, <laughs> yes, don't let those computers rule your day. You can do it with an automatic system, but even more effective is to use any sort of delivery system. But this is a mini sprinkler, which was developed for the purpose of vineyards and orchards to supply water very slowly so that it would soak in. And it's on the end of a hose and it throws out water in a perfect circle about eight or nine foot radius. So a diameter of 16, 18 feet or so when it's on full blast. Full blast meaning no misting into the air, no uh, uh, wasted water, but just a uh, good spray that uh, is its maximum capacity. Throttle the hose down and you can get this little circle to be three feet across, four, five, six. I like it when it's about six or seven feet across and my hose is on just barely on. If you were to have a hose on and take this head off, you would just see as if it were almost like a leaky hose. It uses so little water. 
The other day I was watering some redwoods, coast redwood here in San Juan Capistrano, and I put them on these and leave it sit there for 8, 10, 12 hours, sometimes more than two days. Well, my dog dish, Dakota the nursery dog, hi buddy, how are you doing, was right there. And after about 14 hours of run, his dish had about three quarters of an inch of water in it. And it was just ideal. So I moved it to another spot. Watering by hand means you take this or any method. It could be an old grandma sprinkler that goes like this that you used to run through when you were a kid. It can be anything that will not put out so much water that it runs off. And the goal being to soak in at the end of a hose, turn it on, go about your other garden tasks or go inside and finish dinner or whatever, come back out and move it after three or four hours or leave it on for a longer period. Then you put these away in the storage shed for the winter and it's an ideal cost effective way to water the natural garden by moving mini sprinklers around or any sort of water delivery system. You know what's so fun about water conservation in the landscape, this whole thing that we've been hyping for 30 years? All the water systems in the, uh, all the water conservation hype revolves around how to deliver water to your garden. Sprinklers, um, I was looking at the wrong thing. I've been looking at the computer. <laughs> Kevin says, look at the camera. <laughs> oh, that's not the camera? <coughs> Want me to start over? <laughs> Water delivery systems, drip, low volume, mini sprinklers, efficient heads, stream rotors. You know, I know them and you know them. Guess what? Those don't conserve water. They use water. What conserves water is this, don't water. So native plants that don't require very frequent irrigation are conserving water when the water's off. And when the water's on, it's effective and going deep and taking care of the root zone. You can also do it with this, a good old fashioned watering wand, especially on new gardens, where you soak the ground around a plant that is fairly new in the garden. Page D asks, where can we buy those? Page D asks, where can you buy those? <laughs> we build these from components that we buy elsewhere and sell them here at Tree of Life Nursery. Again, any little hose end sprinkler works, but the advantage of this is that it puts on about an eighth of an inch of water an hour. These are called the precipitation rates. Every sprinkler head is rated. You can find it model number on the, on the little head, nozzle, go online and, un and learn the precipitation rate in inches per hour and then you'll be able to calculate how long you need to water in order to provide a, the given, the, the desired inch and a half of water per event, almost, or up to two inches, or you can just leave your dog's dish out there and measure. Hand watering is ideal. Okay, so that should cover watering in, in, in general for the month of May. Let's go to pruning. Pruning is an activity that allows you to get in touch with your garden in a good way. And you really only need a few tools. You need maybe some loppers for some larger branches. But if you're on pruning fairly consistently, most of it can be done with, with an occasional use of a tree saw or loppers, but continual use of your pruning shears. Now you wanna keep these sharp and you want to keep them clean. And when I say clean, I mean no disease. So just like we have been taught how to wash our hands, 20 seconds, soap and water, we've also been taught about how to sanitize various surfaces and things like that. Disinfest the shears. I was taught in plant pathology, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't really disinfect shears because they're never really infected. It's, a, it's an inanimate object that can't have a disease inside it. So you disinfest the shears and the pruning tools in a solution of water with bleach, 10% bleach, 90% water, by dip, oh, by the way, it may go without saying, but don't shoot or ingest this. You dip the shears in the water for approximately 20 seconds and 
or 10, 15 seconds. And when they're out, these shears are now safe to cut branches and you know you're not transmitting disease. Here, during the corona time, many of us have taken to carrying hand sanitizer. That's cool. We can use alcohol as well. And the added benefit of the corona time is that my shears now have this wonderful lavender scent. So not necessary, pure alcohol would be fine, but first time for those shears to have that. So if you're pruning diseased wood, you want to dip or sanitize between cuts. If you're pruning healthy plants, you want to dip or sanitize occasionally throughout the pruning exercise, just as a habit. We have this wherever we go with pruning shears in Tree of Life Nursery. The same would go for your saw, a little sponge or a rag, and your loppers. This is, this is not COVID-19 rules. This has been Tree of Life rules forever. Sanitize or disinfest the shears. Now, on, on perennial plant, on soft, not so woody plants, they're not properly called perennials, but the sub shrubs, salvia, buckwheat, uh, encelia, these, ty these types of things. You want to prune them after they have flowered unless you're saving the seed. And even then, you should always leave some seed for the seed eating birds, whether it be buckwheat, salvia, or a sunflower, or an artemisia. Uh, if you want to deadhead, which means taking the old flowers off, leave a few. Uh, 30% or so, so that birds that want those can come in and get them. Maybe the seeds will fall and you'll have a more natural looking garden. You can also shape those sub shrubs by um, taking out entire branches from down beneath. Let's, let's not get in the habit of hedging. By the way, true hedging is an art that was perfected over the centuries in places where hedgerows and hedges were useful things. What you see um, uh, where you drive and where you go and maybe where you live when uh, uh, cleanup personnel are on the job with their white trucks and their orange cones and their bright colored vests and their machinery is more of a mutilation than it is a hedging. But that's really a different topic. What we have to do with native plants is not mutilate, <laughs> for sure, and very rarely do we hedge, but we can head back, meaning you take some plants some branches out from way down inside and you do some tip pruning and you shape, no weird shapes please, perfect circles or squares, unless that's the story you're trying to tell with your garden. And you allow the plant to push out new growth uh, even before summer hits. So even a buckwheat now pruned will actually push out uh, some late spring growth and have um, a new uh, life, a new shape, and that growth will harden and be ready for summer if you prune it now. If you wait much longer, you might be risking exposing the interior branches to some really bright hot sun, which could cause sunburn, or you might be encouraging it to grow its second flush during the um, summer months, which we really would like to discourage. So this is a great time for that. That's the sub shrubs, including salvia. Chip, dip those shears, cut at an angle so that the, the irrigation water, we don't have any rain coming, but so that the sprinkler water does not sit and soak into a horizontal cut on a branch because that can start to cause rot, especially on many of the salvias which have an almost hollow stem if they've grown very fast through the winter months. So cut at an angle and then the air will dry the cut and everything will be just fine. On the few of the major shrubs, things like ramnus, which is coffee berry, I hope you can see this one right here. What it could use right now at this time of year is a technique called pinching. It's, this one is coming into bloom, so I certainly want to leave those flowers in place, but you can take out the, the, the very tip of the branch with your shears, and then you occasionally dip or spray in your sanitizing liquid and you are causing the, the branch to, uh, the, the plant to branch out from inside. This can also be done slightly later than now. And 
because this one's flowering, but I'm on a branch here that's not flowering, and I'm taking out two inches of growth. It's called pinching because it can also be done with your thumbnail, and technically you would want to sanitize that as well, but the, the bleach solution would probably be not the best. You'd want to use your good old handy lavender alcohol-based hand sanitizer. That's pinching. There are two other types of pruning done in May. May is an ideal time. It so is October and November, by the way. Thinning would be the activity of going into the tree or large shrub. Now we're talking woody plants, per particularly manzanita, and exposing the shape and the beauty of the branching inside by selectively pruning and thinning all the way back to major branches. No stumps, no ugly little thumbs, no branches that go nowhere, but take out the entire branch and open it up. The bonsai masters have always said that uh, a tree thinned out properly should look like one that a bird could fly through or alight in and make its way through as opposed to a dense, uh, uh, impenetrable canopy. So this is done by, this is called thinning, and it's done at this time of year on plants like manzanita, maybe toyon, but usually toyon is not one that you want to s particularly open up and see the insides, unless that's the story you're trying to tell with it. Um, I'd say manzanita is probably the classic plant for thinning, and not every type of manzanita wants to be thinned. We're talking mostly about the large forms. Some of them are best left as just symmetrical uh, shrubs, and there's very little or no pruning required on manzanitas ever in that case. Thinning. Then there's called heading back, and this is similar to hedging or pinching, but you are taking out larger branches, bigger caliper, and this is done particularly with ceanothus because they're finished flowering. So when the ceanothus is finished flowering, you go in, and you can cut back into the branch, maybe it's pencil diameter, and you are um, pretending you're a deer browsing on the last of the uh, succulent, uh, delicate spring growth because you know a big hot summer's coming and that those woody old stems out on the end with the dried flowers and the seeds and the funky leaves are not gonna be as tasty, so you're gorging on the tips of the ceanosis plant in May. That's one reason they're called buckbrush, buckbrush, ceanothus. They're constant forage for deer. So you pretend you're a deer, and you take out the tips and the outer branches. Sometimes you're taking out wood branches this long, a flower, a few little s leaves, some stems, back into something that's about the caliper of a pencil, and it will be fine. Most ceanothus do not sprout from old wood. So you can't do severe pruning on them. Thinning is not necessary unless there's dead branches or branches that are diseased or branches that are just unsightly and or, or a branch that might be uh, taking up space over a sidewalk or something like that and heading it back is not the solution. Take it back all the way to the trunk, cut it off. But Ceanothus are uh, uh, heading back, Ramnus and other fast growing woodies, uh, pinching, M Manzanita thinning, and the soft branched subshrubs, artfully pruning them in by both taking out branches entire, some thinning if you will, and some heading back as well, including deadheading uh, the majority of the flowers. Let's go now to mulching. Mulching is the activity, if we use it as a verb, in the classic old sense, of turning up the soil, and the soil itself, your soil, becomes now mulch. I know that's not the classic definition today, but that is when you are in the garden mulching, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily applying mulch. We'll get to that in a minute. What it can mean is that you are using your two best friends in May and early summer in the garden to cultivate the top two or three inches of soil, or maybe one inch. Use your judgment on where the feeder roots are. You can't go just grinding up the 
roots of iris or things, things like that in the shade bed just because I said three inches, just down to where it's soil. And you're going back and forth with this little thing. Um, turning the soil just does two things. It breaks up the surface of the soil to allow air back and forth. And believe it or not, it preserves moisture. How does it do that? You'd think it would let moist more moisture out. Microscopically, and Kevin, our doctor science here at Tree of Life, has microscopes at the ready. He can correct me if I'm wrong. But cap capillary water, which is the water that is held on to each soil particle by ionic bonds, by, by, by physical bonds, uh, finds its way out of the soil in sort of tubes, sort of, sort of a, a, a way that the, the soil, the soil uh, that water escapes from the soil through evaporation. And these tubes are consistent and they're built up over time and the soil loses its water. When you break up those tubes, those, those routes for capillary water to be lost into the atmosphere through evaporation, essentially you're holding that water back down where it belongs. Interestingly, by cultivating two or three inches at the surface, you actually hold water down in that 14 inch level. So this is a friendly way to, for you to get out in your garden and see how things are doing and notice you know, where the lizards have been and see the pollinating insects and be part of last year's. By the way, we didn't include weeding. One, I don't have six fingers. And two, you should have already done it in February, March, April. So, but if you do have any weeds, this will work too to help get them out. And you are cultivating or mulching. Now, what we see so common in our ornamental landscapes all around is the activity of bringing in onto the soil a foreign material, which is usually an organic, meaning it was plant-based material, and applying it to the surface of the soil as a mulch. I'd rather call that top dress and I'd rather think of it as part of the story that you're telling with your garden. And so if your story is woodland and moist and uh, sort of a, a dreamy forest, then you do want a thick layer, or not, I'm sorry, I, you just want a generous layer of organic material on the surface. And the very best way to get that is to grow your garden up until it's mature and when it drops its leaves, not deciduous plants in the winter, but leaves always dropping, manzanita, oak, uh, coffee berry, ceanothus, it builds up a layer of forest dust. My favorite term is leaf litter. And it stays there and that's your permanent mulch. And with that in place, you have to do very little cultivating, but it won't hurt to just churn up that a little bit and go into the top surface of the soil and, and get that to kind of freshen up. Uh, without doubt, that's the best top dress, is the natural top dress, the leaf litter that a, a, a mature native plant garden would provide. In a new garden or in a garden where you want to tell the story using organic mulch, organic top dress, and you want to bring it in, don't forget, anytime you bring anything into the soil, into the garden from outside, you're bringing in good things you hope, but could be bad things. Weed seed, disease, organisms that you never had before, Argentinian ants, you probably already have those, snails within eggs, anything that could be in that material that you're bringing in could now be part of your garden and you didn't really intend that. So be very careful with top dress. In the world of organic top dress, there's some do's and don'ts. Real friends don't let friends mulch indiscriminately. So the one that's free, that gets given away by the truckload because they've got so much of it, is the one you want to avoid. And it has, and this is what I've tried to make simple, if, it, if, you're, if, you're, if the proposed top dress has sticks, strings, flakes, and, and dust, <laughs> I had to try to remember, sticks, strings, flakes, and dust, and maybe even occasional bit of plastic. Yeah, sometimes it does. You want to avoid that when it has all four. And here's why. 
This packs down over time. You've seen it. Forms an impenetrable mat. When it gets bone dry, it's very difficult to get water to come through it and soak into the soil. You can have, you can water, 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 water up here on a bone dry stick, string, flakes and dust mulch, and down below there's no water penetrating. I've gone on to jobs in the summer with this in place, two to three inches thick, tried to water the desperately dry soil below, stuck a hose underneath it, and watched this float as an intact mat around the plants that I'm watering. Just no cracks, no nothing, just the whole thing. <whistles> float like a magic carpet. It forms an impenetrable mat. It gets very, very dry and becomes hydrophobic. That's when water won't soak in, like the feathers on a duck's back. When it's totally soaked, it can be uh, detrimental to the stems and uh, leaves and the, the trunk of the plant, the little, the little collar, the crown, because in warm weather with moisture, this turns into essentially a compost pile and it is actively composting. So if your little stem, let's pretend this is your little Ceanotha stem <coughs> and this <coughs> inferior mulch is touching the stem and mounded up around it and it gets wet because you've wa you water even if you water properly in the summer months. Now, well, it's already, I've already stated it's hard to get the water to penetrate, but just the same. Now this thing's soaked and it's 100 degrees out. So this thing's easy, 85, 90 degrees. It's composting. It's marching along eating, digesting, if you will, the organic material in here. It comes to this live stem. Use your imagination. This is a live stem. And it doesn't distinguish and say, oh, hold back. That's a live stem. It just continues to compost right through your little Ceanothus plant. So how many times have we seen this top dress on top of a planting where branches are dying back or the whole plant just goes wrong in August? And many times it's the temperatures with the moisture that are causing composting action to, to damage live tissue on the plant. So avoid stick strings, flakes, and dust. Another popular mulch is pure redwood. It's a fantastic uh, product in its own right called Gorilla Hair. It has sticks and strings, okay? So it doesn't have all four. It's not as bad as stick strings, flakes, and dust, but it has sticks and strings. It can mat, so you have to be careful with this. It would only be used in a garden I think, that wants to tell a story of a moist woodland, and you would never let this dry out. Ferns, coral bells, ribes, iris, maybe ramnus as a principal shrub, philadelphus, a shade garden. And it would be a great story at that level. Thank you. But if you're trying to tell the story of a chaparral garden in East San eastern San Diego County or Riverside or Orange Counties and you have Manzanita, Ceanothus, and Corion, Buckwheat, Salvia, Matilla, Poppy, Penstemon. I think that a more appropriate use would be to use a mineral mulch, which we'll get to in just a minute. This can get bone dry and be very difficult to uh, soak in again. It can stay wet if, it, if it's allowed to, which I think it should be if it's in a shade garden. And it's fairly expensive and it comes from far away. It's ground up redwood bark coming to us from the redwood lumber industry from lumber mills. One that is similar would be the same redwood bark with some shavings that has been ground a little more finely, triple grind. Again, only, in my opinion, for shade gardens or for a garden where the narrative is moisture, woodland, shade, lush, green, walking through a beautiful little stream bed on your way to camp. But if camp is chemise and matilaha poppy and penstemon and lizards and be careful of snakes in May and uh, Manzanita, 
and dry, hot, serious Southern California chaparral, consider using a, a non-organic mulch. Immediately you say, what? Because we don't like the idea of non-organic. So let's call it mineral. Mineral mulch would be, or a mineral top dress, better said, would be for two purposes, to achieve the same goals that you do with mulch, which is conserving water, uh, discouraging weeds, uh, preventing uh, evaporation, that's the conserving water part, and also the aesthetics of the top dress. So a, a decomposed granite or an aggregate, and when you think aggregate, you're thinking stones, rocks, gravel, fine texture, coarser texture. Now I'm not talking about, you know, the whole yard being aggregate and one wagon wheel and one cow skull and three different uh, colors of gravel with headerboard between them. Though, in Yuma, in the trailer parks, that's a cool look. But we're not in Yuma, and we're not snowbirds that visit our trailer only a few months a year. We're, we're building native plant habitat gardens. So let's use mineral mulch as part of the beautiful story we're telling, and even combine coarse with, with fine, with decomposed granite, with organic mulch, maybe a desirable organic mulch, which something chunky will always work. Never will it cause a problem because air moves through it and water moves through it. So this is walk on bark. It's not sticks, it's chunks. If you have a more mature garden, <laughs> you could use bigger chunks. But typically with top dress, the, the newer or the more refined and smaller scale of the garden, the finer the texture on the top dress. And if you had, let's say, a parkway down the center of a big street and it was nothing but mature trees and shrubs, you could throw on as much of this coarse bark as you want to discourage weeds, preserve moisture, and look nice and clean, and it were, would not hurt a thing. But it would be completely out of scale in a small, intimate front yard garden with just a few interesting um, and diminutive native plants. So small space, light te uh, small texture, fine texture, larger space, bigger texture. And when it comes to mineral mulch, you've got several choices with gravel. You have angular or round. Okay, so you make your decision. What's my story? Is it, am I telling a story of a stream bed or of a hillside? Then when you go to the next question, it's kind of like this. Pure white, probably not. You know, it doesn't happen that often in nature. So then what? Brown tones, gray tones, okay. You choose brown, light brown, dark brown. Or you choose gray, light gray or closer to black. Or a combination. So let your top dress help you tell your garden story. Don't just think of it as something that you do from a horticultural standpoint. It's almost, with nat natural gardens and native plants in Southern California, it's almost more important to think of top dress as an aesthetic rather than a need to d do something. Uh, the, the, this, uh, this, would be, this would be round aggregate of multicolors. And I would not necessarily recommend putting any of these mulches, any of these top dresses, as a pure carpet under your whole new planting. It is so cool to assemble the different materials and say, over in this part of the garden, it's more moist. I'm going to put my high quality organic top dress, my chunky bark product around the plants very lightly and scattered. And then I'm going to have that drift into a pattern of decomposed granite with some uh, aggregate blended or off to the side. And you make these patterns on your ground that reflect the story of the plants above and it just folds into itself. It can be so beautiful. And this is on a new garden. It can be added to an older garden. 
but again, the ideal top dress is the one that nature would provide through leaf drop over time. If there's places where there is no leaf drop, you use the mineral top dress where it's appropriate. And don't forget, no matter which you, top dress you use, if any, you have to leave some bare dirt, and this would qualify, for the native bees to make their nests. Let's go to the next thing, which is feeding. We've covered watering, pruning, top dress or mulch. And let's go to feeding. Yes, native plants, like every plant, use nutrients to uh, grow. They use water to grow and to cool themselves. And in the water uptake are plant foods, which are used for sustaining health and for growing. And the native plants are super efficient at getting nutrients out of most soils. That's why no one is taking care of nature out there with fertilizer bags. It has to do with the leaf litter. It has to do with the soil biology and the organic material and the uh, environment where the roots are. In a garden, as gardeners, we're putting a little polish on nature when we plant a natural garden. We're asking the big outdoors to come into our small space. We're going to take really good care of it. We're going to feature plants that are super unique. We're going to have combinations that remind us of all out there, but in this smaller space. And as a result, we have this great reciprocal relationship and this interaction, which includes all these activities that we're talking about. And it's a myth to think that native plants never should be fertilized in the garden. So most people love to use organic matter in their soils as a matter of course, and I'm, I'm one of those. So organic fertilizers available in bags and available for sale. We do not carry them, but they're in different places or online. Um, are very mellow, very gentle. On every fertilizer bag, you'll see three numbers with dashes between them. The first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium, or potash, NPK. Those are the <coughs> symbols for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. M organic fertilizers tend to have an NPK of about, you know, I'm going to guess here, but three, two, two. And those are very low numbers in a balanced plant food. And they add to the soil biology, and they provide nutrients for the plant. So, May, here's what you could do to feed. You could go out, scratch up your soil, mulch, in w soil mulch, or cultivate. Then you could import a top dress, mostly for aesthetics, but maybe for the purpose of covering the ground so that you can have moisture conservation and the, the, um, the look. And then you apply, according to the instructions on the bag, some organic fertilizer. And then you water it in. <laughs> and you will have a activity that you've done all that we've talked about, or you water it in by hand. Now, if you have any one particular plant or an area in the garden that's just really poor in nutrients and the plant growth is really funky, in my experience, I'm not opposed to the occasional use of a commercial fertilizer, which is not organic, it is chemical. Now I'm going to tell you something. I've been telling you stuff. The nitrogen that the plant takes up is nitrogen, regardless of the source. All the plant nutrients, 
whether they're supplied by chemical or organic sources, by the time they get to the plant, N is N, P is P, K is K. That's what the fertilizer salesmen say, and actually they're right. The advantage of organic fertilizer is that it builds soil and that it, it benefits other organisms in the soil, earthworms, microbes, all kinds of insects. It's by far preferable. But the occasional use of good old miracle Grow, which has an NPK of, my gosh, I wish I could find it. Well, it's not going to be 322. It's probably on the box, not on this little bag. But it's like 20, 10, 15 or something, you know? It's, it's, it's strong stuff. This is excellent for potted plants, too. So you put a tablespoon or whatever it says in a watering can, and you soak around a plant that needs a boost, like right now, you know, supercharged vitamin, not so much, forget the word vitamin, supercharged nutrients um, for this, you know, healthy smoothie. You're feeling funky, you need something right now with some supplements that are included. You give this plant this thing and it perks up, okay? So that's the two ways to feed. The pre preferred way for the, for the uh, consistent application of fertilizer to your garden, when I say consistent, I mean May, and then again in October, maybe March, April, May, but not, but not much um, later than now because you don't want to promote artificial growth during the hot months. Or, the occasional use of chemical fertilizers, especially on potted plants or specimens or individual plants that need a boost. And you can put more than one gallon on a large plant. You're gonna have to use five, 10, 15 gallons of, use it half strength, do whatever you wanna do, but you'll see the results. The results on organic fertilizer are long lasting and sustainable. The results on chemical fertilizers are quick and uh, fleeting. So don't get your plants addicted to chemical fertilizer. All right, what was the last thing I said I was gonna cover? Plant protection. This means this sort of shepherding, nurturing aspect that is on the lookout for bad guys. And so our job as gardeners is to watch for injurious plant pests and diseases. So injurious plant pests can mean everything from snails to gophers to ground squirrels to scale, tiny little insects, aphids, mealybug on the roots, mealybug on the, on the stems, wood rats chewing the branches not to eat them, little devils, to take them off for their nest. Uh, disease, which we'll get to. And so we're on the lookout for these and we're going to always point toward natural and organic control methods with, again, as needed, the occasional use of chemical solutions when there's no other choice. So if you have, for instance, in May, Coast Live Oak, and it has the brand new growth from the spring, stretching out, sort of ideally pink in color because it's so fresh and new, leaves and stems, and it's got this white powder on and it's turning into a dead, and it's called witch's broom on Coast Live Oak. There are probably our chemical sprays, fungicides that would solve that problem, but after you kill the causal organism, which is this mildew, you'd still have a dead stem. So nix the chemicals, prune the tips out, Try not to make dust go everywhere because those are spore, spores which will infect other new growth. Discard those branch tips in the trash, not as top dress, and hope for some drier weather so that it, the problem solves itself. On the same note, if you are in the coastal zone and you see downy mildew uh, attacking uh, Galvesia, which is island bush snapdragon, or any of the buckwheats, and, and your buckwheat uh, 
flowers, if there are any still there, it's just coming on, are just drooping down and, they, and, and it's not wilt, it's, it's a disease. Then prune that off, you're gonna lose the whole bloom or apply a chemical fungicide. And you can call or write here to get more information on that, on those details. If a, in May, we have very few plant diseases because the soils aren't warm enough to support root rot. But if we were giving this talk in September, October, August, September, early October, when the soils are 75 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, if the water has been applied wrong and all the moisture is in the top six inches because the water is on frequently and for not enough time for it to soak in, then your roots will be there in the warm, moist soil. And when they start to get root rot, there may or may not be a solution. You might lose the plant. But in some cases, it can be saved, the plant, with cultivation, mulching, cooling the soil down, trying to get you know, just keep it alive until it gets cooler. The use of chemical fungicides to cure, as it were, root rot is, is not to be encouraged. It just, it's just, it, it's why? If it's gone that far on a native plant in the garden, uh, the problem already happened. It, it, it just the, the symptoms and the signs are showing up now and it's almost beyond cure. Avocado growers use chemical fer fungicides, uh, etc. There are ways to do this, but I'm not recommending it for the native plant garden because we want a holistic organic approach to everything. So I've jumped ahead to the problems of late summer. The only problems you're gonna have to encounter right now on disease will be on the branches, maybe some shot hole fungus or some black scab. I don't need to define those. The common name tells you right what it is. It's got a toyo and it's got this funky leaf with all these little brown spots and some black scabs. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's moisture in the air from the marine layer or from your neighbor's sprinklers or from some weird event that the sun came out and it's warm enough for the fungus to grow on the leaf and down into the stem and it looks funky. And it's probably happening on every toy owned in the neighborhood, garden or wild, and it'll go away with drier weather. Witch's broom on coast live oak. Um, but when you need to apply some sort of uh, remedial action is when it's uh, an insect that's out of control. So if it's aphids on, bla on branch tips, try blasting them off with a strong stream of water, little salvia flowering or uh, Areogonum bloom, just hold behind it and blast the little devils into smithereens with um, your strong spray out of a pistol grip nozzle. If that doesn't work, you can use a safer soap, which is an insecticidal soap to spray on those little devils and they'll not like that. Or combine those two activities. Avoid toxic, toxic poisons because they also affect beneficials. If it's scale, I have a big manzanita plant down over there that has branches this big with this little tiny scale existing on it. It doesn't seem to be affecting the plant. There's some sort of coexistence going on just the same. I'm in charge of protecting my plants. I don't like those scale there. I'm just going to take a sponge with some soapy water and wipe them, off, wipe them clean off the smooth bark of the manzanita. So every time you have an insect problem, snails, Go out at night and squish them. Look for them. It turns into a hunt. Send your kids out. Give them a reward for each one they find. Um, gophers, <laughs> another whole topic, but it, it, just pray for the success of owls and hawks or use traps. You, you, you look at each problem, as it were. That was the dog that just tripped over the cord that go, goes back to the office that provides the internet service to the stratosphere so that you can watch me do this. Nice going, Coda. We're good? Yeah. <laughs> you too. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
always look for the natural, holistic, organic solution because in the garden, an infestation or a problem is temporary, it's seasonal, it's momentary. And as we said at the beginning, you will occasionally have a surprise and have to react to something that's happening now in the garden. But as a general rule, the best growers, the best farmers, the best cultivators out there prepare during the good times, knowing that the bad times, that is whatever is bad, if it's frost or if it's heat or whatever is gonna be hard, the hard times are coming and you get your crop ready. So the pruning techniques, the watering techniques, the watering techniques, the pruning techniques, pot dress, and feeding techniques that we've described now will make a healthy garden so that come summer you will have very few of the anticipated plant problems and you'll have to go into not so much the plant protection mode but the plant enjoyment mode because you won't have insects, you won't have weeds, you won't have dry plants, you won't have disease. You may have snails because your neighbor is watering and you're not, sorry about that. As they migrate into your yard, you're going to have to deal with it or you're going to have to convince your neighbor to do the right thing and plant native plants so they're not watering so much. The rabbits, the, the uh, temporary and seasonal um, pests, deal with them as we can, when we can, but more than that, plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. So I think we've covered everything of the five. If you still have weeds, <laughs> you're always weeding, get rid of them. Uh, chemical herbicides, no thank you. Hoe, cultivator, or good old fashioned pull. Okay, do we have questions? We have plenty of questions. Plenty of questions. We'll try to go quickly on the answers. Sorry if I went so long on the, well, an hour. One thing is to show the tools that you had a little bit closer. Some of the materials as well. Okay. Well, could you, I'll bring the I'll bring the whole tray over there. The tools are simply to cultivate the ground. That is to scratch up the top three inches, which is a great activity. Two to three, one to two to three inches of ground at this time of year. Some people will say, "Hey, I'll just be turning up weed seed." Well, if your garden is that new and that by turning, by scratching the soil, you will be turning up weed seed, that'll just give you more weeding to do next time. But don't forget, if you also use that top dress, both aesthetically and horticulturally, you will discourage weeds. And the, to continue with the question, some of the materials that we brought, and I'm gonna add a little new information here. Okay. Well, any of the mineral top dresses you get at the building supply house. So that would be the gravels and the DG, okay? The, the no, the no, these others are available from soil companies and mulch companies. And we have the triple grind. We have the chunks, which are really good. Redwood, big chunks for big gardens, aggregates. And then I failed to mention on this topic of, of um, top dress, that in the world of bringing organics into your garden, there are three things. Let's start with, we've talked about top dress. There's also compost, which I highly recommend you make yourself. And you can go online and figure that out, but that's um, leaves and um, kitchen organics and um, uh, organic material that you're turning and you're um, watering and you're turning and you're watering throw a few earthworms in there to give them a happy day. And you have this rich material that can be used both for planting or as a light top dress, which actually acts as a plant food as well in its own right. It doesn't have three numbers. It's not strong enough to have an NPK and it's not called a fertilizer, but it has nutrients which soak into the soil. That's compost. And then there's amendment, which is what could be used in the planting hole um, in the backfill that goes around the root ball when we plant a new plant. So top dress is not amendment, is not compost, but compost can be amendment and co compost can be top dress. 
though they're separate, they can be used interchangeably, but let's put it this way, they're all organics that you bring into the garden from outside, and you have to be very careful, and you have to use them only as they're intended to be used. Amendment, to amend the soil around a, pl a, a newly planted plant. Compost can be used as an amendment or a top dress, as a very fine light top dress, or blended with the backfill when we plant a new plant. And top dress is exactly what it says it is. It goes on the surface of the soil. When it's top dress, to repeat and to answer the question, you have organic and mineral as your choices. By the way, another choice is none, which if you have great soil and wonderful leaf litter, you just don't worry about this. Another question? Uh, we had a few questions about the best way to prune sages, primarily white sage after they bloom, but also sweet sage. Okay, well, I, I went into that a little bit, but it is after they bloom in both cases, and it is to shape them, and it is to take out mostly the chore here is to uh, remove the, the dead flowers, but we would like to leave some for the seed-eating birds and just because it's a natural garden, at least for a few more weeks until you break them off and put them down in the soil. So you can actually, with, say, Cleveland sage and some of those that have so many flowers, you can actually prune those after they've flowered. There'll be some seed in those little balls that are out on the ends of the stems. And if you've got an area in the garden or some little wasted parkway down the street that you want to do a little, uh, um, you know, Johnny Appleseed salvia planting, mash all that up, turn it into a top dress, and s scatter it on your soil in that bare spot of the garden. If nothing else, it's organic material that will do everything top dress does. And you may just get a few surprise seedlings next winter. Um, this one is from Bob A. During summer, should we water our natives more or less? Well, Bob A., who's Bob Allen, that's a plant. He knows that. And he knows a lot about all this stuff. Bob Allen, thank you for the question. Obviously, we're watering more than in the winter because presumably in a, in a winter where we're getting what we'll call normal rains, we're not watering at all. Do the plants need more water in the summer than in the winter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Technically, no, because they're native plants and in the wilds, they don't get any water in the summer. But in the garden, we're giving them water to make them a little greener, a little cleaner, a little more happy, more like a garden, less like the, 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 um, uh, the beautiful uh, nature of uh, coastal sage scrub and chaparral in late summer, which, which we all enjoy immensely, but it may not pass the musters of many ho HOAs or neighbors, or even the homeowner. They want a garden, okay? And so we do water in the summer more than we do in the winter. The plants also, if they're not from this immediate area, if their native origin happens to be Central Coast or Northern California, and the story you're telling is one that includes those species, they do need more water than what we get in winter. And by extending the watering season into the summer, very judiciously, once every three weeks or once a month, starting in May, then we do have a super healthy garden. Okay, time for one more? Yeah. Okay, a couple of people asked about, uh, had powder mildew with uh, Palo Verde. Okay, this is a fantastic question. question. The, the question is regarding powdery mildew, the disease, which is classic on roses as well, by the way, <coughs> on Palo Verde. And Palo Verde is um, Parkinson, well, Thersidium, what is it now? Aculeata? Parkinsonia. Parkinsonia still? Yeah. Good. Parkinsonia aculeata is Palo Verde, which is native in Mexico and in Arizona. And I don't believe there are any native stands in California, but if there are, they're just barely crossing the river down there in, uh, by the Colorado. It's a pea family tree extraordinarily popular in the nursery industry, especially because it grows fast and has yellow flowers and is readily available and has been promoted voraciously out of Arizona into Southern California. So you see them in a lot of places. And it's particularly you see one that's quite nice. We, we sell it here. It's called Desert Museum, which is a hybrid 
between uh, two species of two genera, I believe, two species, two genera, two genera, um, which was uh, discovered and introduced by the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson. And in Tucson and in the dry parts of California, think our desert, it absolutely thrives. It loves hot weather. It loves long, hot summers. It loves moisture. It's in this, this group of plants called phreatophytes that actually look for summer moisture at very deep levels so that they can sustain this lush growth in what seems to be a bone dry desert, but their roots are extraordinarily deep into perennial water. I mean, really deep, like 30 or 40 feet in some cases, mesquite, Palo Verde, um, the, the cat's claw acacia, these plants do that. And that's its nature. So you take it from that desert environment and put it in the coastal zone. That's anywhere that cools off at night <laughs> by the sea. So figure out where you live. And if you have that happening, that's coastal enough for this plant to have problems. And one of the problems is p powdery mildew on the entire plant, especially in May, April, May, June. The solution is to, if it's a small enough tree, move it to elsewhere in your garden where it won't be surrounded by organic top dress or sprinklers or moisture loving plants or shade or all of the above and try to put it in a drier spot. If it's an old, old plant, you either have to spray with a fungicide like every year, tolerate it or take the plant out and replace it with something that won't get it. That's all I can say. It is subject to powdery mildew in the coastal zone. Some years are worse than others, but it just doesn't get hot enough for it here where we live. Even on our hot summer days, it's saying, really, 95, that's all you got? I want 110, and then I want a monsoon rain shower tomorrow. So this plant is a desert plant, and we recommend it for dry zones in Southern California only. Near the coast, it does have problems. Yeah, I think this is a really good uh, story, actually, but um, this is for people who are planting now and concerns of new plants going into the summer. So specifically, uh, someone who plants at an Ingleman Oak, what's the, what, what, what should I do or don't do during the summer? That is a great question. <laughs> who gave that question? Thank you, Ginger Birdland on Instagram. Here's another example of a chemical fertilizer, by the way. I talked about miracle Grow, which is water soluble to be used in a watering can, but this can be used around the plant, um, again, occasionally, and for that quick boost. I want, to I want to go on record as being one who highly recommends organic fertilizers in every case, but is not opposed to the occasional use of chemical or commercial, they're called, fertilizers to give plants a quick boost. The same goes with the use of chemical herbicides or chemical fungicides. It, and if you happen to be one that says, I'm never gonna use any chemicals at all, that's fine, I totally agree with you for that. But in many cases on the, in the, in the um, ornamental garden, the native plant garden, uh, the, 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 resor the last resort to solving a major problem will involve uh, the use of horticultural chemicals. And by the way, the safety precautions and the uh, general safety of these um, uh, products today are uh, more stringent and higher than they've ever been. Uh, so by the time something reaches your hands and my hands as a consumer, um, it's been through a lot of filters of is this uh, safe for the environment? Where it's not safe is the overuse. The new garden at this time of year, new plants planted in an established garden. This is where you're watering two root zones. Every time you plant a new plant, you're maintaining the, the root ball of the, of the plant. Obviously you've taken the plant out of the plastic pot, but let's just pretend this is the root ball, no plastic, just the, 
just the, the root ball that came from the nursery and the plant growing here. You plant this in a hole, and that's another hole of workshop, and you build a berm around the outside, and you could water this plant, and this is a root zone, and it's the root zone for this plant right now, okay? Out here is all your native soil, and this is a root zone, and it's the future root zone for this plant right here. It's also the present root zone for your existing garden. So you now are managing the water and moisture levels in two, count them, two root zones. The nursery root ball and planting hole root zone and the native soil root zone. As a general rule, this is gonna require water more frequently than the surrounding native soil root zone. So you're going to be watering this by hand, maybe through the entire summer, every 10 days, every two weeks, soaking this um, root ball inside the berm that you built, maybe every two to three weeks. The best way is to dig down with your finger or with a little shovel and dig what I call an inspection hole or feel three to four inches deep. Anytime the soil is dry, three to four inches deep, it's time to water. If you do that in the root zone, the root ball zone, the nursery root ball zone, it will be dry quicker, you know, the intervals between waterings will be shorter than out here. Out here in the native zone, you probably can't get your finger down in there. So you get a little trowel and you dig a hole three to four inches deep and you look at it and you feel it and taste it and smell it. And if it's dry, it's time to water out here. So you're testing and watering both root zones. And the new Engelman oak that you planted here will require water, I'm gonna guess every two to three weeks, at least to not let the root ball dry out. And then by next fall, these roots will be out here because you haven't neglected this root zone. The native soil root zone is getting watered once a month, once every three weeks with a deep soak. And that encourages these roots to go out here so that next year, you don't have two root zones to manage, you've got one. Don't forget, I know you know this, when you lose your car keys, dang, I can't find mine, and you find them, you stop looking. <laughs> Sorry, but that's true. The same with roots. When they search for water, and they do, and they find it, they stop looking. So if you only water the plant nursery root ball, the plant roots will never go out into the native soil looking for water, okay? On the contrary, if you only water the native soil out here, given that this is an artificial soil that you've created here with amendment and digging the hole and the backfill and the nursery came, the nursery plant came with a root ball, I got news for you. You might properly manage this native soil out here for the existing garden, but this plant will dry out, okay? You, it will dry out. So there's your answer on how to manage two root zones, that is when you are planting new plants in an existing native plant garden. All right, so I think we're finished. I appreciate everyone staying, uh, watching this. Uh, it'll go online at the YouTube channel and we can, you can tell your friends or see it anytime you want. If there's a way to speed it up and have me talk more like that, you could watch the whole thing in 20 minutes. But I do appreciate you hanging in there. We tried to cover a lot of information. May is a critical month. It's a get ready month. It's a season of its own. Um, so is a, a late summer, early fall but we'll talk about that then because you have to get plants ready for winter. But we're getting ready for summer and enjoy your May and your June. And don't forget, July coming and it's long days with high temperatures, warm nights and no relief for your garden unless you have fortified it and got it ready during May. If you need more information or you have additional questions, don't forget to write us at gardenhelp at treeoflifenursery.com. That, that, uh, we respond as quickly as we can and we love to get those questions and those concerns from you. Gardenhelp at treeoflifenursery.com. 
and include photos whenever possible because that really helps. Also, where you are and some details about the environment itself as it relates to what your question is so that we can give you as good an answer as we can right off the bat. All right, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin Allison. You are awesome. And you have done it again, another virtual workshop during Hold these canyon flies about social distancing. I have my own two dozen. Do you want any, Kev? I can lend you some. I've got plenty. You got your own? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> they should know better. They're landing on me even, but they're certainly buzzing around more like six centimeters, not six feet away. So thanks again. We really appreciate you coming. You come join us. We're open. Oh, that's right. Come pick some strawberries. Oh, those little, li yeah, little details. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> Tree of Life Nursery has been open throughout the entire time, and we do have um, faithful and loyal customer base, plus many new people coming and experiencing this place during a time when an experience like this place is sorely needed. So please come. Uh, we do have all the protocols in place. You don't need to me to tell you what they are. We all know them. And we also have strawberry field and you pick strawberries going. Go online to see about that. This is with our uh, uh, joint venture partner called George Kibbe. Many of you know him from South Coast Farms. He grows the best berries in the land. So. Uh, a lot going on at Tree of Life Nursery. We've added a line of vegetable plants for you to take home and put in so that you can have your own edible vegetables and culinary herbs blended with or certainly near your native plant garden through a part of our nursery called La Finca, the farm at Tree of Life. So a lot of new stuff coming on and we invite you to come be part of it. Um, and pretty soon here, we'll be doing these workshops live again but i think we'll always have a recorded component from here on out because um well kevin learned how <laughs> so don't don't be going anywhere kev because dakota doesn't know how to do this stuff <laughs> thanks a lot you guys appreciate you and stay well stay safe